Uh, uh, greetings. I um, want to introduce to you The Man of Peace, the, this book, which is the illustrated life story of His Holiness the Dalai Lama of Tibet, who I have known personally since 1964, for the, I guess 53 years now, and who everyone knows really for, I guess especially since he got the Nobel Peace Prize in 1989, and uh, who's a wonderful person and who really in our, this time of chaos, fear of war, refugees, you know, 80 million people running away from something somewhere, I think in the worldwide, and huge amounts of refugees and things. There is one major world figure uh, often, you know, rivals the Pope in popularity worldwide, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and who stands for peace against a, a very oppressive empire that has his people under control and his land under control who invaded it in 1950, and the world seems to let them get away with it due to their sort of either fear or greed in relation to China or the Chinese market. And... Uh, and yet he persists, and he smiles, and he brings blessings, and he can even get on John Oliver and have a great show on YouTube, which I recommend you see. It will give you a taste for learning the story of His Holiness's amazing life. He's 81 years of age now, and pushing 82, and uh, he's, um, he's had an amazing life, and he's ne never compromised himself. He stands for peace, he acts peace, he walks the talk of peace, he talks the talk of peace, and walks the talk of peace. And uh, we are very proud in Tibet House and relieved and delighted to have finally finished, after years, uh, the graphic novel, uh, uh, making it easy for people to follow the drama of his life, seeing the good guys and the bad guys and how he escapes from this and he just does that and how he gets this recognition, but then he gets persecuted in that way. So these ups and downs, and, and in a way ending in a very sad note, of course, where Tibet is trying, China is trying to completely finally sweep Tibet and the Tibetans under the final rug of themselves as the great superpower, the rival of America, and therefore no need for democracy, no need for self-determination of people, no need for human rights and all this. They're trying to do that. And that's sort of, unfortunately, that's where we kind of end, uh, you know, right around now. But we, to, to salvage that, to keep up the vision that he has of the future, we show in an epilogue his vision of how it, will get, how it can work. Because the key point, when you stand to resist, and especially when you do it nonviolently, you're seeking dialogue with people. And in order to have a good outcome in a situation of conflict and disagreement, you have to not only stand for your position, but you also have to help the other imagine a situation where they wouldn't have to stand in conflict with you, where it would be a win-win, where they would have what they want, what they really want, which is not to go around killing you and taking your stuff and then wrecking the place. They really want a thriving the world beloved, world renowned, like jewel in the crown Tibet for China, which the Tibetans are proud of and, and create according to their unique cultural abilities and their deep insights and their amazing knowledge and, and kindness. And you be the patron of that. And then so this is what Chinese emperors used to do for thousands of years in the successful, many Chinese empires were successful and prosperous and fine. And that's when the emperors supported the people to be creative, not when they just crushed them down. You know, They didn't maybe have parliaments and things like that, but the, they had an idea that the good emperor was definitely aware of what the people needed and wanted. They were not imprisoning the people. and They were not starving the people. They were not forcing them to fight useless wars. When that started happening in dynasties, then the dynasties would collapse. But in the good times in the dynasty was when the, emperor, the leader really loved the people and felt part of them and worked for them against like, you know, robber barons and this kind of people who wanted to exploit and use people to compete with each other. So you have to show a positive vision. So we show the positive vision of the win-win. We show a world that is not polluted by petroleum 
and by by climate excessive climate change, climate warming, or carbon pollution, and as the water is not polluted by chemicals, and the soil is not polluted by wrong kinds of fertilizers and pesticides and things like that, and where the skies are good and the food is good and medicine is fine and the health system is good, and people are happy and there are no wars because there's no need for wars because now we all know what everybody's got and we all know how to get enough out of whatever we've got. And there's really, if technology were entirely used for prosperity and it was shared with people, which doesn't mean there still wouldn't be some rich people, but not the gross exaggeration of like hundreds of billions, one person, what can they possibly do with that? But, but you know, enough, few, you know, to hunt a couple hundred million, oh, yeah, hey, that, that's kind of enough, don't you think? A couple hundred million, you kind of get by with that. And, and let other people, you know, share out, you know, so they, everybody's got 50 grand or 100 grand. And free free health and etc. And doctors don't have to worry about what, who do I pay and what they just serve the patient. And uh, so a world like that, which he sees, no war, care for the individual. You know, no big massive systems that crush individuals. You know, overcoming so and no racism, no come no religious fanaticism, mutual understanding between religions, no conquest of one religion by another. You know, none of this like white Christian nations were going to conquer everybody, for example. No, no, uh, everybody's going to be a Muslim. No, everybody's going to do anything. You know, everybody's going to be what they want to be, each one. So no war, no this, no crazy fanatic leaders, no pollution, and a beautiful world. And then Tibet itself becomes like a garden of health, high altitude for people to hike and because you can be happy there at the low, less oxygen for a short time and have a good time if you're very careful how you do it and you know how to do it, take the right herbs and so on. And it's a great tourist venue and then all kinds of spiritual teaching, a branch of the UN, training diplomats how to meditate and not get angry when someone is insulting or dismissive about them and how to remain calm. Actual training people to develop more compassion and more patience. This is what the Tibetans are really good at. And um, and that's the Dal that's our epilogue. That's the Dalai Lama's vision of the future of the planet, and it's very very hopeful, very very delightful, because he is like that, and it will be like that. I also predict that. You know, when I'm sick or when I'm feeling down, or when terrible things happens like have been happening lately, I also get very depressed and discouraged. But somehow, at the depth of it, you can turn and think and find somehow still the wind blows, the sun shines. And, um, you know, so it's okay. Okay, so Man of Peace, please go get it. There's going to be an ebook, which is not yet up there. Paperback goes up in a few days. Hardback is already up on Amazon. Bookstores can order it. Uh, you will be inspired. Your children will be inspired. Your friends will be inspired. Man of Peace, the illustrated life story of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, the 14th Dalai Lama of Tibet. Uh, by we, William Myers and by Robert Thurman and by Michael Burbank. Okay, production of Tibet House, uh, Tibet House U.S., the Dalai Lama's Cultural Center in America, distributed by Hay House International.